Hello and thank you for watching part 3 of The World in 2018. I hope you will be as amazed in considering the information in today's video as I was while I was putting it together. It is amazing how the Lord guides one to passages in His Word that He wants us to take note of when we consider the times before us as we watch for the Bridegroom to arrive for His Bride. I apologize that this video is somewhat lengthy, but I believe we are really on the verge of very important events occurring in the world and for which our Heavenly Father is giving us clear pointers so that we who are watching for His return can rejoice as we see prophecies fulfilled and our blessed hope approaching. I would also like to apologize for the fact that I really rushed to get this video done and I may not have paid enough attention to the details or made it visually as pleasing as some of the other videos as I had to get the information out as soon as possible. Once again, I must state that I am only sharing with you what I see in the Word of God and how this could possibly point to events playing out before us in the world today. It is up to God whether the fulfillment of these events plays out as we see it or whether He chooses a different application. Please keep this in mind when you consider the information provided in this video. In the previous video we saw how the Word of God pointed us to the 24th day of the 11th month or the month of Shavat and how this day is associated with a red horse as given to us in Zechariah 1. This red horse symbolism is explained to us in Revelation 6 where we see the association with war and when we search the Word of God a red horse is only mentioned in the following two passages. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sebat, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah the son of Barachiah the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses, speckled and white. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword." As you probably know by now, on the morning of February 10th, a serious incident occurred in Israel. What Israel claimed to be an Iranian drone that was apparently launched from a Syrian airbase crossed into Israeli airspace and Israel took it down with an Apache helicopter 90 seconds after entering Israel's airspace. The Israeli Air Force then took out the control vehicle of the drone which was launched from the T-4 military airbase in Syria. Israel subsequently lost the F-16 jet that went to destroy the control vehicle when Syrian air defenses shot it down. Israel then launched an attack and destroyed at least 12 anti-air installations in Syria, dealing a heavy blow to air defenses in Syria. A telephone conversation between Putin and Netanyahu then ended the escalation and since then, and at the time of putting this video together, no further aggression was seen, although many threats have been made by various nations in the Middle East. There are however some aspects surrounding this incident that I believe one should pay close attention to. And I could be completely wrong about this, but please consider the following. Days before the incident, Netanyahu went to Moscow for five hours to have a meeting with the Russian president to discuss the Syria, Lebanon and Iran situation, apparently. Very little information on the actual exchange between the two leaders was divulged to the public. Netanyahu said after the meeting that he mentioned to Putin that there are two conditions which Israel would not accept, and that is Iran establishing a military foothold in Syria and Iran transferring weapons to Hezbollah in Lebanon. From Netanyahu's facial expressions when shaking Putin's hand, it would seem that he has put his complete trust in the Russian president. And I've had a feeling that this meeting between Putin and Netanyahu was somehow linked to the incident that took place on February 10th. Some aspects about this incident with the drone entering Israeli airspace that may come as a surprise to some, 
is that the drone, which Israel says was from Iranian origin, was launched from the T-4 airbase in Syria. This is significant as this airbase is the largest in Syria and according to this article from Depka News published on February 1st, the Russians are massively converting this airbase into their main center of aerial operations in Syria. Now think about this. If Iran launched a drone from the T-4 airbase, which is now Russia's main center of aerial operations in Syria, do you think that it is remotely possible that Russia would have been completely unaware of what happened right under their noses and would have allowed Iran to use the facilities that they have reconstructed and are in control of without knowing what Iran's intent was with the drone? Another point which leads me to believe that Russia was fully in control of or at least part of what happened in this exchange was the fact that a former Russian diplomat told Al Jazeera News that Russia gave Syria the green light to shoot down the F-16 using Russia's advanced air defense equipment. In this article published in December of 2015, we see the issue of Israel's air superiority being clouded with the presence of Russian air defenses being established in Syria since this time and reaching far into Israeli airspace. And in this article by Ynet News, the Israeli Air Force chief said that the F-16 was shot down by Syria, making use of Russian equipment. It would therefore, in my opinion, seem that any trust that Netanyahu had placed in his relationship with Putin was voided by what happened on February 10th. And this is also quite significant prophetically, as I will soon show you. Having said that, for those of us who are watching, I was very encouraged by the fact that we had a serious red horse incident on the 24th day of the month of Shavat, just as the Bible predicted, coinciding with what is shown on TorahCalendar.com as February 10th. Since we have not seen any further escalation in the situation on Israel's northern border, up to the time when this video was made, I have become a little impatient and I was wondering if the Word of God had further information for us regarding these events and what could possibly follow in the weeks and days ahead. I was wondering if there would be more insight we could glean from the passages that would seem to point to the events of the past few weeks. I have also been wondering whether our Heavenly Father would point to other dates in the near future that would point to prophecies that we know have to do with Israel's enemies coming together and rushing towards them to wipe them out, and our departure that would seem to coincide with such an event. Today I would like to share with you what I have discovered, and it is just amazing to see how the Lord breaks open His word to us at just the right time in order for us to gain understanding of the days right before us. Now once again, I'm only human and I'm not able to see into the future and the dates which I'm going to point at may apply to this year or it may apply to a year in the future. However, given the events that have now transpired in the Middle East and Tuba Shavat pointing us to the fact that God is watching over His word to perform it, I would think that there is a high probability that some of these dates given to us will apply to this year. It is also amazing to see how our Heavenly Father would seem to be using historic events that were recorded in His Word to point us to events that will happen in our near future. In the previous video we saw that Jeremiah was shown an almond rod in the first chapter of this prophetic book and that the word almond in Hebrew is spelled the same as the word watch or the word wait. This is very significant because the Lord told Jeremiah that he is watching over his word to perform it. When Jeremiah is shown the almond branch, unfortunately the King James Version translates the word watch to hasten, which I suppose would be just as appropriate in my opinion, given the impatience that we who watch have to deal with on a daily basis. Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast seen well, for I will hasten my word to perform it. 
So let us see if there is any additional understanding we can get from these scriptures, taking into account the events that have transpired on February 10th. We started off with a super blue blood moon that marked the day on which the new year for trees is kept in 2018. And this day is known as Tuba Shavat. This association is given to us in Jeremiah 1, as we have just seen. Given that this day was associated with a very unique super blue blood moon and that God said he would watch over his word to perform it, and the fact that we saw a major red horse event occurring on the same day in which Zechariah was given the red horse vision, I believe we should search the scriptures for more information to see if the prophecies that God gave us, pointing to the events that we soon expect, will also be fulfilled on dates that are pointed at in the Word of God. The blooming of the almond tree in 2018 may have marked a period in history for which most of the prophecies, for which we could never find proper associations in the world today, may be accurately coming to pass on dates that the Lord had hidden for us in His Word. As I have said, all of them may not be intended for 2018, as this world has at least another seven years before it, but two of these prophecies have already shown to be meant for this year. Let us combine what we read in Jeremiah 1 with what we see in Zechariah 1. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sebat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses speckled and white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees, and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still, and is at rest. While we see Jeremiah being shown that the Lord will watch over his word to perform it, Zechariah is shown the symbols of war, as discussed earlier. Can we find any connection between God watching over His Word and the purpose of the horses which are said to have gone to and fro through the earth, telling Zechariah to behold or to watch and see that the earth is still and at rest? If we apply Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10 to these two passages, looking for additional pieces of the puzzle elsewhere in the Word that would seem to tie these together, we discover a very interesting passage in 2 Chronicles 16, where we read the following. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. This passage would definitely seem to be binding together the eyes of the Lord watching to perform His word and the horses running to and fro through the earth to watch the situation on the earth. It specifically refers to the eyes of the Lord watching over His word to perform it according to Jeremiah 1, running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself reliable to those who are watching for Him to fulfill the prophecies recorded in His word. This would also be the key, in my opinion, for us who closely watch events occurring in the world and how they line up with Bible prophecy, to know when to expect His return. The final sentence in this passage needs a little more perspective to understand, but it is amazing how this would seem to apply to what we see happening in the Middle East today. In 2 Chronicles 16 verse 7, we see that the prophet Hanani came to Asa, who was the king of Judah at the time, telling Asa that instead of putting his trust in the Lord, he relied on the king of Syria, and as a result, the king of Syria is escaped out of his hands, and that Judah would from this point forward have to face wars. Let us see what this section says when we bring this situation into context. 
And at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians, and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Is this not exactly what Netanyahu did when he met with Putin? Placing his trust in the Russian president instead of looking to our Heavenly Father. It would also seem that Putin's authority in Syria exceeds that of Assad, given the fact that Putin is reported to have given the green light to the Syrians to shoot Israel's F-16 down. This would also seem to put Putin in a position where he could be considered the king of Syria, and that Netanyahu's reliance on Putin may have resulted in bringing about the prophecies which have been proclaimed over the nation as well as Jacob's trouble. I was wondering if we could also find an application with regards to Jerusalem or Israel where Jeremiah 1 and Zechariah 1 could be tied together and the word of God gives us just such an instance in Jeremiah 5 where we read the following. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. This chapter continues to describe a terrible judgment proclaimed over Israel for their refusal to receive correction, and to return to the Lord and to recognize their Messiah. The judgment that follows describes an ancient nation being released by God consisting of mighty men or geborim in Hebrew, which is the same word that is used in Genesis 6 to describe the giants that were in the earth or the Nephilim, which came about as a result of fallen angels mixing their seed with that of women. I believe Jeremiah 5 is really important and even though it may be a bit lengthy, let us see what else is said. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say, The Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, Surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me unto the great men, and speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord, and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke, and burst the bonds. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evenings shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Every one that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, they then committed adultery, and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were as fed horses in the morning, every one made after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit thee for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Go ye up upon her walls, and destroy. But make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, 
It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. And the prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them, thus shall it be done unto them. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people wood, and it shall devour them. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Their quiver is as an open sepulchre. They are all mighty men. And they shall eat up thine harvest, and thy bread which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thine herds. They shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities wherein thou trustest with the sword. Nevertheless in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. And it shall come to pass when ye shall say, Wherefore doeth the Lord our God all these things unto us? Then shalt thou answer them, like as ye have forsaken me, and served strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob, and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it. And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth us unto the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares. They set a trap, they catch men." As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat, they shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? This nation of mighty men, which the word tells us is currently being restrained, and it will have been brought about by mixing of the seed of fallen angels with that of men, is also described in Daniel 2 verse 43. Here Daniel describes to us the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and these represent the ten hybrid kings mentioned in Daniel 7 and Revelation 17. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Zechariah 11 also associates three of these kings with Daniel 7, telling us that three of them will be removed in one month, and these will then be replaced by the Antichrist, who will also have mixed DNA, or as the word of God puts it, having the mark of the beast, and not made after the image of God. Daniel is also told in Daniel 12 verse 4 that the sealed book would remain sealed up until the time of the end, when many will run to and fro, and when knowledge would be increased. Many running to and fro are what Zechariah is shown when he sees the horses running to and fro to inspect the earth. 
I believe that there is a possibility that this may have been the trigger that pointed us to God telling us that we will now see him fulfill his word accurately, just as we saw the Red Horse event occurring on the 24th day of the 11th month. The question we have to ask then is, what happens next and what does the word of God show us with regards to forthcoming events that have been prophesied? When we look at what the word of God describes to us regarding the rapture, we know a few things of which we can list the following. Firstly, the rapture will come upon the world unexpectedly. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. These passages in which Jesus addressed his disciples, in my opinion, tell us that the world will not be alarmed to the fact that a dispensational change is about to occur. These passages describe the situation in the world as life as usual, where the world and those who are not watching would not be aware of that which is about to happen. The activities that Jesus pointed to, people sleeping together, preparing food and working in the field together, Eating, drinking and marrying wives are all activities that would be associated with normal life that everyone is used to. Then suddenly, everything changes when this day that we are watching for arrives. Paul provides us with more detail of what will happen on this day. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul describes a resurrection event in which dead people will come to life, and those who are alive will be changed into glorified beings. In previous videos I have shown how what is known as the first resurrection is modeled after the harvest pattern as well as the model of the temple of God and that Jesus' resurrection with the Old Testament saints or the elders represented the first fruits of the harvest and the temple's most holy place. If you have not seen this you are welcome to watch the rapture part 2 understanding the first resurrection for more background on these concepts. There remain two additional resurrections, one associated with the holy place of the temple, or the main harvest of God's field of faith, and the final resurrection representing the outer courts of the temple that are trampled underfoot, which is also associated with the gleanings of the harvest that are left to the poor, and which, according to the Bible, the owner of the field is not allowed to harvest. Paul describes in this passage the main harvest in my opinion, given the fact that there are people who will be alive at the time when it occurs. The final resurrection of this three-part series is described to us in Revelation 6 and 20, where those who form part of the final part of the first resurrection will exclude any person who will be alive at the time when this occurs, 
and separating or distinguishing it clearly, therefore, from what Paul is describing. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The main harvest event in which Paul describes people both dead and alive being changed into glorified beings will soon occur and Paul does not mention anything with regards to refusing the mark of the beast or being beheaded as being part of this event. The word of God then describes an event where the main harvest of God's field of faith will be reaped and where the gleanings will be left behind as a result. And this is associated with events described in Isaiah 17. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass, that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. This passage continues to tell us about a situation in which many nations will rush for some reason, and when we see a situation in the world where this is beginning to happen, we will know that Damascus will soon be destroyed and the second harvest event or the rapture will occur. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters but God shall rebuke them and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. What would cause many nations rushing in the Middle East in the vicinity of Damascus? There are three passages, among others, that we need to take note of in order to understand what is described in Isaiah. First, we read the following in Psalm 83, where we see the nations named and the reason for them rushing. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom, and the Ishmaelites, of Moab, and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon, and Amalek, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them, they have hopen the children of Lot, Selah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kishon which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and as Zalmona, who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. O my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind. 
As the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. In Psalm 118, which is also associated with the year 2018, we see the following written, and note how 2 Chronicles 16 ties into the first two verses in this passage, pointing out that Netanyahu, who would have seemed to have put his trust and confidence in Putin, may have made a grave mistake by trusting in Putin, who would seem to be allied with Syria and Iran. Netanyahu should have trusted the Lord instead. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees, they are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and is become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. In this passage, we once again have a possible pointer to the Prime Minister of Israel putting his trust in the President of Russia, or even the USA, instead of trusting in the Lord alone. This passage continues to describe Israel's enemies surrounding it and about to attack it, but then being destroyed, which would also include Damascus being taken away forever. I am of the opinion that this event in which Israel's destruction will be averted, and where the nations that surrounded it to destroy it will flee like stubble before a fire, will all be part of the great deception with which the world will be deceived. This supernatural intervention will have Israel believe that their Messiah finally intervened on their behalf, only to find out that this person whom they believe to be their Messiah is in fact the idle shepherd, as described in Zechariah 11. This passage also mentions the voice of rejoicing in the tabernacle of the righteous. This, I believe, points directly to the rapture, Paul telling us that we are the temple of God when we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and at this point where the rapture occurs, our bodies, or tabernacles, will be glorified and proclaiming that we will not die but live, just as described to us by Paul when telling us about the rapture. We see another pointer to this event in Luke. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. The supernatural intervention may not affect Israel at the point where the rapture occurs, and the reason for this will be to deceive God's chosen nation. In Daniel we read that Jerusalem and the rebuilt temple will only be destroyed when the Antichrist sets himself up in the rebuilt temple to be worshipped. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, what about the timing of these events where the nations will rush toward Israel to destroy it and to take the houses of God into possession? Does the word of God provide us with any pointers to when we can expect this? In the case of the red horse prophecy that was given to Zechariah, which occurred in the eleventh month, I thought I would search through the Bible for events that are associated with the eleventh and twelfth month to see if there were any dates that were given in similar fashion to the red horse vision that may point to what we have just considered, where we see the nations rushing to destroy Israel. I found two dates that would seem to be highly significant in this regard. The first is given in the following passage, and this date would be associated with the period between February 18th and March 2nd, if it applies to 2018. 
It concerns the king of Egypt, otherwise known as Pharaoh. Now, we cannot be 100% certain that this passage will apply to 2018, as I've said, or whether it points to a year in the near future. But given the match between the Red Horse vision and February 10th, it would seem to follow the same pattern and it describes several severe judgments being passed over the nations which we saw mentioned in earlier passages as well as the destruction of specifically Egypt. Egypt in this instance could also be representative of another country symbolically. We will have to allow time to pass in order to obtain a better understanding for this. This passage would therefore seem to cover the events that would start on February 17th or 18th and culminate into many of the rushing nations having perished by March 3rd to 4th, if it applies to 2018. And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion in the nations, and thou art as a whale in the seas, and thou camest forth with thy rivers, and troublest the waters with thy feet, and foulest their rivers. Thus saith the Lord God, I will therefore spread out my net over thee with a company of many people, and they shall bring thee up in my net. Then will I leave thee upon the land, I will cast thee forth upon the open field, and will cause all the fowls of the heaven to remain upon thee, and I will fill the beasts of the whole earth with thee. And I will lay thy flesh upon the mountains, and fill the valleys with thy height. I will also water with thy blood the land wherein thou swimmest, even to the mountains, and the rivers shall be full of thee. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven, and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. I will also vex the hearts of many people, when I shall bring thy destruction among the nations, into the countries which thou hast not known. Yea, I will make many people amazed at thee, and their kings shall be horribly afraid for thee, when I shall brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life, in the day of thy fall. For thus saith the Lord God, The sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon thee. By the swords of the mighty will I cause thy multitude to fall, the terrible of the nations, all of them and they shall spoil the pomp of Egypt, and all the multitude thereof shall be destroyed. I will destroy also the beasts thereof from beside the great waters. Neither shall the foot of any man trouble them any more, nor the hoofs of beasts trouble them. And I will make their waters deep, and cause their rivers to run like oil, saith the Lord God when I shall make the land of Egypt desolate, and the country shall be destitute of that wherewith it was full, when I shall smite all them that dwell therein, then shall they know that I am the Lord. This is the lamentation wherewith they shall lament her. The daughters of the nations shall lament her. They shall lament for her even for Egypt, and for all her multitude, saith the Lord God. And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations, unto the nether parts of the earth, with them that go down into the pit. Whom dost thou pass in beauty? Go down, and be thou laid with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword, draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down, they lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Asher is there and all her company, his graves are about him all of them slain, fallen by the sword. 
whose graves are set in the sides of the pit, and her company is round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. There is Elam, and all her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. They have set her a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. There is Meshech, Tubal, and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war. And they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and shalt lie with them that are slain with the sword. There is Edom, her kings, and all her princes, which with their might are laid by them that were slain by the sword. They shall lie down with the uncircumcised, and with them that go down to the pit. There be the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Zidonians which are gone down with the slain. With their terror they are ashamed of their might, and they lie uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword, and bear their shame with them that go down to the pit. Pharaoh shall see them, and shall be comforted over all his multitude, even Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, saith the Lord God. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living, and he shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised, with them that are slain with the sword, even Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. What is even more amazing is that the dates that are given to us in this passage are also incorporated in another instance where strong emphasis is placed on the associated dates and where we have another instance or situation describing Israel's destruction by those that surround them. I am of course referring to the story of Esther in which the king made a decree that all Jews were to be destroyed by the people of the provinces under his rule. We see this instruction given in the following passage, which is also associated with a specific date. And the letters were sent by posts and to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The thirteenth day of the twelfth month coincides with March 1st to March 2nd. This is not the only verse pointing to this date in this book. We also have the following passages. And he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' name, and sealed it with a king's ring, and sent letters by posts on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, 
When the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had rule over them that hated them, the Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. Also note that Esther means star, and represents the bride of Christ that have replaced the wayward wife of the king, Basti. She represents the nation of Israel who chose to reject the king's commandment. The following passages come to mind. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. It is also interesting to see that Haman had ten sons who would represent the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and the ten kings that will soon rule over the earth. These plotted against Israel, but were killed in the end, while the remnant of Israel will survive. If I have to give my interpretation of what I understand from these passages, it would seem to point to the following. Firstly, it is quite profound to see the Lord giving us two instances in His Word where the same date applies to two unique scenarios, and where many nations will be destroyed while Israel is victorious. Both of these dates point to the start of March, and the name of this month also means war. It is possible that we may see some event occurring on February 17th or 18th involving the head of Egypt or the head of a nation that is represented symbolically by Egypt, and in this case the USA would seem to be a possible candidate. If we do see a significant event occur in the world where the head of state for a specific country is involved, either assassinated or where a specific statement is made that would provoke the country surrounding Israel, then we can know for sure that the rest of this passage will very likely also play out and that the world could very likely see the nations mentioned in Psalm 83 pulling together to rush toward Israel, to destroy it in the days leading up to March the 1st. This coordinated attack against Israel, according to the word of God, will be launched on the 13th day of the month of Adar, or from sunset on March 1st to sunset on March 2nd, according to TorahCalendar.com. If we see several nations amassing around Israel and rushing toward the country to destroy it, then it is time to look up, for this would also be the time for our departure from this world. The events that will lead to Damascus' destruction will most likely coincide with this time frame and will also lead to the destruction of the nations that wanted to take Israel as their spoil. And it will also usher in the new age under the rulership of ten hybrid kings who will probably come with their own explanation of what happened in order to deceive those that remain on the earth, especially Israel. Millions of people will disappear, being raptured to our eternal homes, while many will be killed in the Middle East by an event that will protect Israel and have Israel believe that the time of their Messiah has come. Three of these kings will then be killed over a period of a month, and the Antichrist, being one of the ten kings, will be revealed to Israel and the world, taking the place of the three hybrid kings that were removed and he will implement the mark of the beast. This will be the start of Jacob's trouble, and this will be the worst time that those alive on the earth have ever experienced. This time will be worse than the days before Noah's flood, as Satan will have full and unrestrained control of the earth, and will be able to do as he pleases with those that remain behind. The only restriction that would seem to be in play during this time would be that Satan and his Antichrist will not be able to force someone to accept the mark of the beast. However, every person that refuses the mark will be killed through beheading. God explains in Zechariah 11, associated with the destruction of Lebanon, 
which will most likely also coincide with this event, that he will break his covenant with all people at this time. This covenant is the one that he made with Peter in Matthew 16 verse 18 to 19. No longer will those who remain on earth have any authority over Satan and his servants. This will not be a time for the church to evangelize the world. The bride of Christ will no longer be on earth, exercising restraint, and those who remain will weep and gnash their teeth, knowing that they refused the invitation of our Lord to join Him for the heavenly marriage, and possibly hearing the words, I know you not, coming from the Lord's mouth. While Israel is not besieged, and based on what is written this will likely play out over a short period of time, there is still time for you to make sure that you are right with your Heavenly Father. When you see the nations gathering around Israel to attack it, you should recognize it as the last sign that will be given to the world to know that the church's time on the earth and God's grace towards those who live on the earth whether they believe in Him or not, has come to an end. If you continue to believe that there is no God, or believe in Jesus, but that He is delaying His coming and that He will only return after the tribulation, you stand the chance to be granted your belief, and to only see Him in the hour that His feet touches down on the Mount of Olives, when all of the Gentiles who refused the mark of the beast would have been killed, and two-thirds of the nation of Israel had perished. Even if you have believed your entire life that there is no rapture, don't stand on what people have taught you, but consider what the Word of God says. There is only one way to obtain salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ. If you believe in another way to be saved, you are wrong, and will have to face the consequences if you do not change the path you are on, before the rapture occurs. If our Heavenly Father has to punish the church during the tribulation to refine it as many believe, what does that say about the work of Jesus on the cross? If that is what we believe, we say that Jesus' gift of salvation which is given freely to all who would accept is incomplete and unable to save people unless they add their own works to what Jesus had done. This would be a works-based salvation, and the Word of God tells us that no person will stand before God and boast about their works, but that all the glory will go to Jesus. Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus washes us with the water of the Word to clean us, and to present us to Himself spotless and without wrinkle. We have no involvement in this process except for believing on Him to perform His Word and to save us from our sins. When we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, it does not matter whether you sin a lot or whether you sin a little. Both situations are complete transgressions of the law, and if you fail at one point of the law, you fail at the entire law. However, our sins, whether they be few or many, are covered by the blood of Jesus. Our righteousness comes only from what Jesus did, and as such we would make God a liar if we assumed that He would pour out His wrath over those that He loves and whom He had set free through the blood of Jesus already. We would also make our Heavenly Father out to be a hard and evil person who would burn His bride in fire before marrying her. Who would expect such action from a bridegroom in love with his bride here on earth? And yet, these are the properties many assign to our God who is love, when we expect to suffer His wrath during Jacob's trouble. If you have been saved, and if you are expecting the Lord to return for us soon, watching and praying as He instructed us, then you have nothing to fear. A glorious time in the presence of our Heavenly Father, His Son, and us filled with His Holy Spirit, in new bodies completely rid of sin awaits us in the very near future. If you are unsure if you are saved, or if you are saved, but you do not see our Heavenly Father for who He really is, then you have reason to be concerned. You may just hear the words, I never knew you, coming from His mouth. If you have not accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, and if we believe in our hearts that the Father raised Him from the dead, then we will be saved. 
Every person that calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. If you have not done so, do it today. Confess your sins to God and ask Him to wash you clean with the blood of His Son, Jesus. And know that nothing that you can do can add to the completed work of Jesus. He receives all the glory and all His righteousness is imputed to us when we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you have done this, you should look forward to our gathering together in the air with Him when He comes to remove His bride from the earth. This is the sum of the burden that He placed on our shoulders. Believe in Him and watch for His return. Most people find this so difficult as it is completely void of any self-gratification, as we all want to prove our worth to God and earn His respect by adding to that which He has already done in perfection for us. However, when we try to add to the salvation that God has given us, we only spoil the perfectly clean robes with which He clothed us as we pile on filthy rags, which will require another cleansing process. I hope you are as excited as I am to see what happens in the days before us. If nothing happens, then we continue to watch and see what else the Lord shows us. If we do see the events described in this video coming together, then we know that our waiting is finally over, and that we are soon going to be united with our Lord in the air. I cannot wait for this moment, but if we can reach one extra person in the time that we have to wait, then it will be all worth it, especially for that person. However, time is running out and soon it will be too late. Until next time, or until we meet in the air. God bless.